Hi, dear, hi our dear attendees. Now, once more, we are together in one of the uh, AspaFlex webinar series uh, like we have been doing for the last two years. Uh, in this uh, webinar, we will be discussing about perioperative care in pediatric cancer patients. As you know, these uh, children has to uh, go undergo lots of series of uh, operations uh, and the therapies under anesthesia, and they are very fragile. So we will be dealing uh, with our uh, cancer pediatric patients. Uh, today, our program is... Um, our program is uh, with uh, our precious speakers uh, from uh, Turkey, France, and uh, uh, India, uh, Jana Bor, Lucas Opitz, and Dr. Jason, our doctor. Uh, the program uh, will be led by me. Uh, I'm uh, Serpil Ustalar Özgen from uh, Ajbadem University, uh, in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, lead this webinar since we have very uh, precious uh, speakers here. Uh, the program consists of, uh, we, we will begin with uh, Dr. Janan and she will be speaking about uh, perioperative management of an infant with neuroblastoma. And Dr. Lucas Opitz will be speaking about iterative anesthesia, which is a new term in uh, pediatric anesthesia, iterative anesthesia in radiation therapy centers. And Dr. Jason doc, uh, Doctor will be speaking about uh, the postoperative management of children after major tumor surgery, tumor excision surgeries. Uh, we will have a uh, question answers and discussion part at the end of this uh, all talks uh, and then we will uh, finish about uh, 6.20 uh, by Singapore time. Uh, now I uh, am working at as I said in uh, Istanbul uh, and um, my interests are in pediatric anesthesia, uh, as you uh, know, uh, and um, we have a uh, moderators uh, from uh, Korea and uh, from India, uh, from uh, Cambodia, sorry. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Hee Soo Kim is from Korea uh, and uh, she is working at Seoul National University Hospital. Uh, and uh, she her interests are in pediatric anesthesia, machine learning of medical data and medical devices. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Nung Fik Tae uh, as the comment moderator. He's a consultant anesthesiologist and working in the National Pediatric uh, Hospital in Cambodia and he is a member of Komachun Society of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. He is interested in neonatal anesthesia and uh, he does pediatric cardiac anesthesia and neuroanesthesia. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, before I give the word to Dr. Hee Soo Kim, uh, I want to remind you some of our uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, you can ask questions uh, during the webinar, uh, but uh, we will discuss them uh, lively at the end of the all webinar. But during the webinar, you can ask the questions in the questions and answers section. Uh, write them, and uh, we uh, during the uh, discussions we will uh, reply them. Chat and raise hand functions are disabled. Please do not use them. Our moderators will highlight your questions at the end of the uh, uh, speech. Uh, regarding the certificate of attendance, we, they will be sent automatically generated and forwarded to the uh, ones who submitted the post-webinar survey, which will be sent to your uh, email addresses. Post-webinar survey will be forwarded tomorrow at 5 uh, Singapore time through email. Please ensure that you have correctly keyed in your full name and emails so that the certificate of attendance are uh, sent correctly. Uh, and uh, please, uh, these uh, webinars are all recorded and they will be online at the Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesia's website, at fa Facebook and YouTube. Please uh, visit, like and follow us. And you can find there all previous uh, webinars as well. 
And um, during our lectures, we, there will be polling questions. When a poll is launched, you will be prompted to answer the questions. You will have 30 seconds to respond and submit your answers. We will share the results soon after we end the poll. After the results is shared, you may close the poll so that you can uh, see the slides shared by our speakers. And I give the word to uh, Professor Dr. Hee Su Kim. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Kenan Bohr. Uh, her uh, lecture is uh, Perioperative Management of an uh, Infant with Neuroblastoma. I'd like to introduce her uh, once again. Uh, she is uh, anesthesiologist, uh, associate professor in Aige University School of Medicine. Uh, he, uh, she is working in many societies and she has several positions, uh, ASPA, TARD, uh, TYBD, ERC, RD, uh, GKDA. And her interests are uh, pediatric anesthesia, intensive care, CPR, ophthalmic anesthesia, and safe TC. Okay, Dr. Uh, Kenan Pora, please. Hi. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee giving me this opportunity because really it's great the pleasure to be here. Today we are going to talk about neuroblastoma and anesthesia. And I don't have any conflict of interest about this talk. Let's start with the case. And as you see, a cute girl, she is 24 months of age and she admitted to hospital with abdominal pain and vomiting. And in the imaging, we have seen a large diameter of tumor. She had just mild anemia and catecholamine level were high and also metabolites were high. And we opened, uh, we planned open surgery. And which drug shouldn't we use for premedication? A, midazolam, B, ketamine, C, dexmethodomidine, D, propofol, E, clonidine. Let's see your answer. Okay, uh, we got the answer, and uh, we shouldn't use ketamine because all. ketamine makes sympathetic stimulation and she had all of the high catecholamine levels. And she will have such a big surgery. As you see, she has big tumor and we will take it out. And also she will get a very big incision, large incision. And what is your anesthesia plan for her? A, general anesthesia with volatile anesthetics. B, regional anesthesia plus general anesthesia. C, TIVA. D, regional anesthesia plus TIVA. Okay. Okay, we will see the answer at the end of this talk. Today, uh, in, in this talk, we are going to discuss about uh, neuroblastoma and surgery and uh, anesthesia and cancer relation and perioperative management and fluid and blood management too. As you see, in childhood time, we can see many tumors, but the most common is neuroblastoma. After that, lymph tumor comes. And a neuroblastoma is an embryonal tumor, we know, and it originates from sympathetic uh, nervous system and derives from neural crest located any place to synthesize catecholamine. And we can see in newborn infants and children too, mostly they are under four years old. And on the diagram, you can see at the diagnosis, nearly half of them under one years old. And incidence is high, and we can say 10% uh, in pediatric tumors. 
and most common estacranial solid tumor in childhood. Unfortunately, she has a metastasis at the diagnosis time, nearly, nearly 75%. And regional metastasis to lymph nodes, but distant metastasis to bone marrow, bone, liver, orbit, or skin. And mortality is nearly 15%, we can say. Prognosis is changes because patients depends on patient stage, age, and diseases of histology and biology. And uh, literature says sometimes spontaneous regressions without treatment, but mostly aggressive and disseminated disease. Of course, gold standard is induction chemotherapy and then uh, surgery treatment. And locate any place, as I said, uh, in sympathetic, uh, along the sympathetic chain. We can see on cervical, thoracic, intraabdominal, retroperitoneal, or pelvic. And uh, what kind of problem makes us in the operating room? It makes us, for example, on the cervical, can compress airway and trachea. Sometimes we can see a Horner syndrome too. On thoracic, we can see compression of vena cava or uh, aort, uh, aorte, and uh, we can see respiratory distress, pulmonary atelectasis. Interabdominally, sometimes it's very huge, amount, uh, big mass, so uh, can increase the intraabdominal pressure that makes us risk of aspiration and pulmonary atelectasis. In the retroperitoneally, and uh, secrete the catecholamine and makes uh, hypertension and sometimes heart failure too. Luckily, we don't see much pelvic location, but uh, literature says can make uh, cord compression, paraplegia, and paraplegics. As you see on the cervical, how a close relation, relation to a big vein, arteria, and nerves. Uh, that big mass and makes compression to airway too. So uh, before the operation, we always check the image. On the thoracic neuroblastoma, as you see, uh, extends skull basis to posterior mediastinum and also risk of causing damage to big vessels, arterias, and phrenic nerve, sometimes laryngeal nerve, brachial plexus, and needs uh, such a different incision. On thoracic neuroblastoma, also, uh, it, it originates from thoracic sympathetic ganglion chain, mostly is retro uh, posterior mediastinum, and it has a better outcome compared to abdominal neuroblastomas. Uh, we can uh, perform the operation uh, open, thoracotomy, and or sometimes thoracoscopy. And abdominal neuroblastoma, mainly location is uh, adrenal glands, so needs adrenalectomy and mostly unilateral adrenalectomy. Um, we can perform the operation at uh, open laparoscopic or robotic assisted also. But sometimes tumor is very huge, can compress, uh, as you see, uh, before the operation, we should check uh, where it compresses. Pelvic location, as I said, we don't see much, but uh, if, it, if we see, um, it is challenging for surgeon and also uh, anesthetist also. And uh, you can see uh, the location sometimes compresses uh, spine and neurosurgeon also admit the uh, operate, operate, uh, operation. And image-defined risk factors is a, is a score system. And you see, it's a huge tumor, sometimes compresses big vein, arteria, and other organs. And uh, before the operation, uh, we should shrink the, shrink the uh, tumor. So uh, compression uh, get back, then the uh, surgeon can operate the patient. And surgery, I said, uh, can be open, laparoscopic, robotic, or video assisted. And what is the role of anesthesia in neuroblastoma? You saw all the stages on the uh, slides. Uh, for the imaging, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy, we give sedations. And uh, for the uh, biopsy and resection of uh, oper uh, tumor, we give general anesthesia. Sometimes for the um, a procedure, invasive procedure, we give anesthesia also for pain control and intensive palliative care, also we take a role. So 
every steps. We should uh, communicate and plan with the multidisciplinary team and explain to patients and family and always discuss with them. Preoperative evaluation is important for the anesthesiologist. Sure, we should get full history. Did she get any chemo? Did she get any radiotherapy, surgery, or immunotherapy? And we should examine the patient, take the vitals, EKG. If she gets uh, chemo and uh, especially doxorubicin, uh, does she have any symptoms about cardiomyopathy? And uh, sometimes hypertension, we can see, near, we don't see much, nearly 10 to 19%. But if she has, always check the drugs. How long did she get? Uh, anti-hypertensive. Always we should check whole blood uh, count and all the uh, laboratory and check the imaging also. For the premedication, for the premedication, we can use midazolam, clonidine, dexmetotomidine. If she, the patient has IV access, we are very happy. We use propofol. While parents are hugging their child, uh, we keep them asleep in their uh, lap. Then we take the patient from uh, them. Uh, mostly we use metazolam perorally, and sometimes we use uh, dexmetotomidine if the child refuses uh, taking uh, perorally uh, metazolam. We give intranas nasal dexmetotomidine. Uh, we use three micrograms per kilogram, and we get really good results. Uh, but we are happy with the propofol also if she has IV access. Intraoperatively, if uh, we, it's just biopsy, we give standard monitoring. But if the tumor, uh, we are planning to resection, whole tumor, always we insert radial artery, give uh, invasive monitoring, central venous catheter. And uh, you can use literature says pulse pressure variation as stroke volume variations. And uh, we always insert nasogastric tube. And sure, we want to see urinary, uh, we want to see urine output and always keep the temperature, uh, uh, we keep the patient from hypotherapy. So insert the, the temperature probe uh, in esophageal. And uh, in the induction, uh, if the patient has IV access, you can use propofol, but uh, if they uh, doesn't have, so you can use volatile anesthetics. And after IV line, uh, give enough amount of opioids and neuromuscular blockers and lidocaine to suppress sympathetic, uh, uh, sympathetic response. And after that, intubate patient. If it's a thoracic surgery, you can use one length ventilation. And uh, for that, also discuss with your surgeon. And the intraoperatively, uh, we don't see much uh, hypertension, we rarely, very rarely, uh, three to three percent uh, literature also says. And mostly we can see while the uh, surgeon manipulate the tumor. And that time we might see hypertension, mostly we see tachyarrhythmias. And uh, it, uh, preoperatively, most patients take uh, alpha blockers. So when they come to operating room, uh, their hypertension is regulated. And in Turkey, we have prazosine and doxazosin. Uh, if we need uh, uh, phenoxybenzamine, uh, we should take it from other countries, uh, but we can uh, use prazosine and doxazosin uh, mostly. In the operating time, in the operating room, uh, if we get any intraoperative hypertension, what can we use? We can uh, use remifentanil, esmoporol, uh, dexmetotomidine, and also magnesium sulfate. But also literature says fentolamine, sodium nitroporcid, glycerol uh, trinitrate, labatolol too. Um, mostly we take control with remifentanil. We sometimes rise up the level uh, amount till three microgram kilogram per minute, and uh, we take control to hypertension. Uh, but rarely we use esmolol too. What is the uh, uh, critical part of resection after tumor ligation? Because when the surgeon ligates the tumor, then suddenly hypertension uh, might become. And that time we need fluid resuscitation. Uh, even we give fluid, 
sometimes we need norepinephrine or epinephrine infusion too. And with the fluid management, how we manage? Uh, first of all, we follow 2022 fasting guidelines. So six hours for solid, four hours for uh, formula, and three hours for breast milk, one hour for clear fluid. So patients don't come to operating room uh, with dehydration. And in the operation, uh, operating time, we always uh, calculate uh, fluid restation case-to-case -case basis. Uh, and for the maintenance fluid, we give balanced solution with one or two percent dextrose in it and always check the blood glucose and uh, imperoperatively. And if we need replacement therapy, we use balanced crystallized solution too, and mostly plasmolite or rinder lactate. And the uh, purpose of uh, fluid management, keep the patient ergonomic and maintain adequate tissue perfusion and oxygenation and avoid hemodilation, definitely avoid hemodilation. And sometimes we give uh, volume therapy too. And we, that time we need 5% albumin. And sometimes we use hydroxyacetate starch also. We don't uh, use gelatin too much because of anaphylaxis. Sometimes we need uh, transfusion, blood transfusion too, but we don't want to blood, uh, give blood transfusion because we all know blood transfusion makes transfusion-related immunosuppression. And that makes infection, cancer recurrence, and, uh, and increase the cancer-related mortality. That's why we, we, we always uh, approach as a multidisciplinary team. And oncologists, when they saw the patient before the operation, they optimized hematopoiesis if patient needs give iron, folate, or B12. And in the sur uh, surgery, uh, we also, an as an anesthetist or also surgery, minimize uh, blood loss and bleeding, and always optimize physiological tolerance of anemia. And if the patient is bleeding, we check the hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, level and uh, always calculate a minimum allowable blood loss uh, for every patient. If the patient is bleeding, if you have uh, for the blood products, you can check uh, viscoelastic assays and then give what she needs. And uh, our approach should be restrictive hemoglobin approach. So uh, for infant and children, we accept seven gram per deciliter. And in the beginning of surgery, we give antifibrinolytics. Uh, we, us we usually use tranexamic acid, 15 milligrams per kilogram, and always keep the patient from hypothermia. This is the really big uh, problem in the operating room. And as a uh, blood transfusion, Anesthesia and surgery also itself immunosuppressive. And we know postoperative pain, hypoxia, hypothermia inhibit natural killer cell activity. And some volatile agents like isoflurane, sevoflurane also. And uh, some uh, many uh, studies say opioids has uh, in inhibition of natural killer cell activity. But on the contrary, and uh, pro, uh, some of the agents promote natural, ki natural killer cell activity, like desflurane, beta blockers, propofol, local anesthetics, cyclogenes, cyclooxygenase inhibitors. And uh, you can see on diagram, opioids and volatile anesthetics uh, suppress the immunity and uh, increase the trauma to more growth, metastasis, and angiogenesis. And uh, propofol anesthetics, propofol and local anesthetics, has a negative effect on uh, metastasis, tumor growth, and angiogenesis, and uh, increase the immunity, natural killer cell activity. And you can see many, many, many uh, literature on the uh, PubMed and uh, on the internet, uh, and lately also comes some of the literature, but most of them are retrospective, and uh, they are studied on uh, adults and all the colorectals, breast, ovarian C, uh, ovarian cancer, and melanoma, some others. 
none of them are uh, neuroblastomas. And uh, but some studies says propofol and volatile anesthetics. Uh, there's a propofol and uh, com compared to volatile anesthetics, uh, Tiva has potential beneficial effects. And one of them says it has positive effects. But uh, we don't know yet. The anesthesia is a friend or foe. Some of the agents are close to friend. Some of the agents are close to foe enemy. And uh, we can't say yet because many of the studies are uh, in different cancer types. They have used different opioids. They use different anesthetics, anesthesia type. They some of them use regional anesthesia. Some of them they didn't. Didn't. And some uh, of the patients uh, got blood transfusion. Some of them didn't. And they had different drug doses, different uh, patient temperature, physiological stress. And uh, we can't say the exact uh, decision. That's why. Current evidence does not justify any change in clinical practice. Just stress, stress the, and pain responses as much as you can say, we can say. And uh, with the neuroblastoma, lately a uh, study came from Singapore and they compared the uh, general anesthesia plus general and epidural anesthesia in neuroblastoma patients. And they looked for uh, recurrence, so relapse free, free survival, but they couldn't find any significant, significant data. So we can't say just uh, perform epidural or regional anesthesia, but we can say stress the stress response and make very good analgesia. That's why you can use epidural or some of the plugs. And in my center, we usually use uh, transverse abdominal plane block and ureter spain plane. And we are very happy with it. And if you can, you can do also. At the end of this talk, I can just suggest that and uh, do very carefully preoperative evaluation. And if it's a big uh, surgery, use invasive monitoring. Then you will see uh, how safe you are. And if you can, if you have opportunity, you can use TIVA, use regional anesthesia, and use minimum opioids if you can. And uh, always follow restrictive transfusion protocol and use effective analgesia. Whatever you do, yes, just do effective analgesia. And thank you for uh, listening to me. This is my city, Izmir in Turkey, and we would like to have you in here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your a nice lecture. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kanan. The next, I would like to invite Dr. Lucas Opit to talk about um, iterative anesthesia in radiation therapy center. Dr. Lucas is a uh, head of pediatric anesthesia in radiation and proton therapy center of Anton Lucas Oncological Hospital in France. He is a senior neonatologist in uh, NICU uh, University Hospital in Nice and also a consultation for perinatology projects and pediatric anesthesia and intensive care in different regions of Eastern Europe. His interest in ethics in perinatology, promotion of free access to effective health service for every uh, child around the world, and also his interest in uh, simulation also. So now please enjoy with uh, Dr. Lucas. Dear, my dear fellow pediatric anesthesiologist from Asia, from this huge continent with so many different realities, so many cultures, so many people, 
and I'm sure so many different anesthesiological standards. I was very flattered when I was asked to participate at this webinar. Um, flattered because I think that our exchanges might be very, very fruitful and very interesting. Um, I was talking about standards and uh, saying about, about the different standards we have in our different realities. And one might think that in Europe, standards are quite homogeneous. This is actually not quite true because uh, as I could experience when I was asked to build up a pediatric anesthesiological unit in a radiation center in the southeast of France, in Nice, for the proton therapy. I, I first looked around me and so I tried to find out what were, were the standards of other centers. And I realized that, well, everybody actually tried to do the best he could or she could in, a, in a quite difficult circumstances. And so I saw that there was no real unity and no clear guidance of how radiation centers should be implemented. And this is what I want to share with you. And um, be, But before sharing this, I want to uh, point out that I have no conflict of interest. Uh, and I want you to understand that uh, you might ask for some recipes for how to implement anesthesia or sedation in radiation centers, but I will not give you these recipes because I will just ask questions. So you will have more questions even, which we, which might be a basis for us to discuss later. So first of all, I want to show you this boy who is five years old. He's quite an uh, already a grown boy and uh, he could, uh, have this uh, radiation um, treatments uh, without anesthesia or sedation, but uh, he had a quite a difficult uh, clinical uh, moments, and therefore we had to take care of him uh, in uh, and to do some sedation or general anesthesia. Usually, our children are rather um, well between two and three. This is the standard child we would put uh, asleep or uh, for radiation um, treatments. Uh, but sometimes it goes up until five or even more if they are not um, stable or if their psychology does not allow us to have uh, the treatments without them moving. This is the main issue. These children should not move because if you move of a sm small little slight um, tenth of millimeter already, the treatment will be might be not efficient or dangerous. So we have this five-year-old boy. He's 20 kilos uh, his weight is 20 kilos, and he had, a, in a quite a dramatic way, um, as always for neurosurgery, uh, a surgery for anaplastic and ependymoma, which was grade three of the posterior canal fossa. And the postoperative period was very difficult with long lasting stay in PICU, with brainstem edema, and uh, with Mm, hypertension, uh, intracranial hypertension, leading uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, difficult weaning from a ventilator with a palsy of right vocal cord, swelling difficulties, and therefore aspiration system. All this in a context of a of a child that had kind of a coma. Um, so, but according to the SIOP, which is the International Society of uh, Pediatric Oncologists. Uh, the treatment, the radiation treatment, should start at the latest for 42 day, uh, days after the surgery in order to be as effective as possible. Uh, but this child was in the PICU and it was very difficult to take uh, uh, to, to, um, to treat him within this frame. So we had to do the dosimetric CT scan. Uh, we tried to do it as early as possible. And that was in mid-August 21. The, the, the history started in June 21. And uh, when we received the child, because you must understand that between the CT scan and the actual treatment, there are at least 10 to 14 days uh, lapse of time because uh, the radio radiation oncologist has to do all his calculations and has to do the radiation program. And this takes quite a few, a long time. So we received him at mid-August and he was uh, in spontaneous ventilation. He was extubated, but he had a high flow uh, oxygen um, 
cannulas uh, of with 40 liters a minute. He had lung reputations he, and his lung was definitely not a good shape. It was a, well, a pneumonia, a nosocomial new, pneumonia with, uh, with, uh, due to the aspiration syndrome. Uh, he was a kind of slight locked in syndrome he so he reacted to the to the environment but not in an adequate way and he had uh, spontaneous um, movements that make him made him uh, being unable to stay calm uh, and immobile during uh, radiation treatment he had also had a gastric tube and a pick line so what would be the anesthesiological tactic in this case here you can see the radiation treatment plan that would be a target volume of 54 gray that would be split into 30 sessions. That means that this child, as many child, children that we uh, treat, would have um, a repeated iterative anesthesia every day for six weeks or sometimes even more. In this case, uh, chemotherapy was given after the treatment, but uh, in other tumors like rhabdomyosarcoma, we would uh, do um, chemotherapy in the main in the in the same period as the radio radiation therapy. So that makes it even more complicated. So this is what it looks like. Uh, you see uh, the. Um, our proton therapy center with our machines and uh, the treatment. And um, I want to ask you if you know the 10 anesthesiological commandments. <laughs> it's kind of a, a joke, of course, but we all in anesthesia know that we have to keep our airways open of our patients and to allow the oxygen and CO2 exchange. We need normally always a venous access. We have to monitor the patient. We have to keep a, keep a record. And we have to be ready for any event that might happen and to be to intervene fast and to be prepared to this, to be timely. Uh, we have to impose uh, an adapted fasting to our patient. That is very important. But in, in a, an oncological situation, uh, the, the, the nutritional aspects are very important as well. So we have to take a balance out of this. Uh, we have to avoid all iatrogenic complication, toxicity, nosocomial infections, or discomfort, we have, but that's what we do in the normal surgery to uh, not to accept clinically unstable patients. We have to evaluate the risk and we should be time efficient. Also, our uh, authorities should give us all the means, all the infrastructures for doing this in a, in a safe way. But if we have anesthesia every day for six weeks, that means that we have also to pri prioritize ties the child and the parents well-being because a child with a big stress undergoing radiation therapy every day for six weeks that would be a, that is a pretty quite a big challenge psychologically spoken so we have, have to understand what are the issues in iterative uh, radiation anesthesiology what are the radiation oncologists must? And I was talking about the fact that the, ch uh, the children should not move, not even the slightest mi millimeter. What are the risks? What should be anticipated? What are the adverse effects, accumulating effects, iatrogenic, conosocomial? What will be the comfort of life in during this period? So is there a, the best, a best technique? And what should we do with very young children? Because sometimes it goes... We start from one year on, but sometimes we have even smaller children. It's rare, but it can happen. And so we have to understand if this conforms to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, with all what we have, all these different issues, as you can see here, makes it very, very complicated. And so we can say that uh, the, uh, iterative anesthesia for children in radiation centers is a real challenge. And we can ask ourselves, are we outlaws? So here we have this little Pinocchio, I don't know if you know him, who wanted to save the world, but the judge says that he, he has to go to prison. So we have kind of always this kind of thinking of, well, maybe there might be some legal issues, or some medical legal issues, which, well, we know in America is extremely frequent in Europe. I don't know. It's kind of intermedium. I don't know about you in Asia, in a, your different realities. Uh, so if you want to look at the things individually, what can we do? 
to keep the airways open, no device, laryngeal mask, or an endotracheal intubation that would be every day. Imagine how invasive this is. Venous axis, we know that uh, central venous axis is, is prone to complications. And um, uh, we have chubby small children that are difficult to, to wear. Peripheral uh, venous axis is difficult, and especially during six weeks. So we have to discuss this. Remember that central venous axis always exposes to iatrogenic risks so that might be up to 25%. So we have to stay close to the patient. But how can we stay close to the patient if we are separate from the, this patient by a big wall and a serpentine that goes to the uh, treatment room where this big wall of, of full of concrete and, um, and, and lead? So this is, again, we need a remote control. We need good infrastructures and devices. We have to stay close. Well, again, we cannot stay close. So we need things set, uh, being, being far away and we need a remote control for that. So we need what the classical monitoring and the more monitoring we have, the more we can anticipate if there was any problem. So if there's any problem, we are in a remote place. Pico is far away. There's no other uh, pediatric anesthesiologist around us. We are all alone and we have to deal with this. We are surrounded with people who are good professionals maybe, but in radiation and not in anesthesia or intensive care. So we have to involve them in helping us if there was any problem. And therefore it's good to have uh, medical simulation and in situ simulation. Uh, regarding the fasting, we, we all know that our children have to have empty stomachs, but as classically we say it's uh, uh, six hours before the, the, the anesthesia, uh, and two hours for clear liquids. Some uh, um, studies showed that uh, four hours would be enough, but in the case of radiation therapy, where you have, well, especially in neurological patients, where you have uh, the crossroad reflexes that are uh, often quite bad, is this sensible? Is this acceptable? Questions to be asked. Um, also, we have to ask ourselves, do we accept clinically unstable patients? Because um, usually for a surgery, if a minor surgery, if a baby is, has a bronchiolitis, for instance, we will not put him asleep because the risk would be too important. But in an in a oncological context, we need this treatment to give him the best chance for for uh, for being healthy again and uh, should we say okay today we will not put him asleep or should we just go on and take the risk so also we need to avoid uh, iatrogenic complications and this is our uh, uh, our um, challenge and our responsibility we should not lose precious time and uh, as always in an operational theater the surgery th the surgeon is waiting for you uh, to finish your anesthesia maybe your local anesthesia and he's kind of nervous and so you get nervous too well in the radiation center it's a bit the same you have to be time efficient because there's a lot of a long list of other patients that are waiting so there is maybe a the best possible uh, technique to be as efficient as possible, especially if you want also the child to wake up early and be able to live a normal life afterwards. Also, the means, the infrastructures. So that's a big issue. Very often in radiation centers, we don't have a recovery room. We don't have a, a, a gas scavenging, scavenging system. So this is very political and very uh, administrative, and we have to to um, to sensitize these people that is very that what we do is very important and that safety for patients is very important. So regarding the complications, we know that in a normal in ASA one patients only uh, pediatric patients that have no problems, but. Uh, uh, for just one anesthesia, these risks would be uh, of 0 0.4 out, out of 1,000, according to one publication. But this can be higher, 5.2 in another um, observation, observation, observational trial. So, so it's 
quite big in, and we we know that many anesthesiologists who deal with adults are not very happy with children because it stresses them quite a bit. Also, on long term, we want to know if um, there might be neurological risks for immature brains like in children. Then we know that there is a neurotoxicity and uh, like uh, 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 an impact on the synaptogenesis, uh, especially during the growth spurt period. Uh, also, uh, there might be well cellular death. So that happens. That might happen if you do one anesthesia. What does it also happen when you do thirty anesthesias every day? So, is there some evidence? And you look at at uh, the literature and you see that there's well, not really. We don't really know. And this is what is so interesting because we can maybe discuss about this a little more. We can publish more and we can do more research about this and to understand what is really going on. So uh, these are the controversies in, in iterative anesthesia, uh, invasive versus minimal handling. Uh, should we do sedation or general anesthesia? Should we do a general anesthesia in intravenously or with through inhalation? And what is the, 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 the management of the airways? And also the question, do we need an intravenous line every time? Or maybe we can make some exceptions, even though it is, does not really correspond to the 10 commandments I was talking to you before. So that's why uh, three years ago, I, I welcomed uh, a lot of uh, colleagues from all over the world in this first international meeting of, on iterative pediatric anesthesia here, here in Nice. And it was a very nice meeting, very interesting. And we wanted to see each other again and talk again. But then COVID came and since then there's a kind of a rest. But perhaps maybe something more will happen in the next future. And maybe I was thinking that if I was invited in Istanbul in Oct next October, some of you colleagues and us uh, and me, we can well, come together and sit together and discuss all this together and these issues that would be very interesting for me to meet you and to discuss that. So as a conclusion, I would say that radiation anesthesiologists need legitimation uh, from their own professional congregation. Um, some used protocols might not correspond to the dogma which we have to these commandments. They are off-label, but they need to be um, to be considered, uh, and they should be acknowledged as an indispensable support uh, for the well-being of the child undergoing a radiation therapy. So we need standards, infrastructures, and minimal handling, and this could be uh, defined by guidelines. So multidisciplinary discussions are definitely a plus. And this is the child we treated at the beginning, who actually after a few weeks got better and better. And this is how he put himself asleep by himself. As you can see, he's watching, well, you don't see it, but because the, 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 the screen is here, but he's watching TV, well, a film while putting himself asleep. So that's very interesting and nice experience. So again, if you want to communicate also before maybe meeting in Istanbul, then we, uh, you, this is my address with which you can contact me. So this is um, uh, the end of my presentation, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, uh, this is uh, the last lecture. I'd like to introduce the third speaker, Dr. Uh, Jason Earl Doctor. Uh, his lecture title is Postoperative Management of, uh, of Children After Major Tra uh, Tumor Excision Surgery. Uh, he is professor and consultant to anesthesiologist, Department of Anesthesiologist, Anesthesiology, uh, Critical Care and Pain, Tata Memorial Hospital, Homi Baba. Uh, Barbara uh, National Institute, uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, he is an editorial board member in uh, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, and uh, he is a reviewer for Indian Journal of Anesthesia, uh, JOACP, Airway, and uh, IJMS. Uh, 
And her, uh, his interests are a measurement of uh, difficult airway, pediatric anesthesiology, uh, postgraduate uh, teacher, uh, guideline commitment member for uh, uh, drafting uh, AIDAA airway guidelines for uh, 2016, and AIDAA national EC member, uh, and also West John member. Uh, Dr. Jason, please. So good afternoon, everyone. I will be talking about post-operative management of children after major tumor excision surgery. So before I begin my talk, I would like to take a poll question as to who manages the post-operative pain in your institute in children undergoing tumor resection surgery. A, pediatrician. B, surgeon. C, anesthesiologist. D, dedicated acute pain service, including anesthesia run APS. So we give you 30 seconds to complete the poll. And we can have the responses, Vivian, in uh, whenever you are ready. Right. So I begin with uh, the next uh, bit of my talk that uh, what are the components of post-operative uh, management that I will be addressing? So I will be covering the post-operative analgesia and pain management, the post-operative monitoring, post-operative ventilation, Post-operative delirium in children, what are the post-operative investigations that are routinely uh, required, the fluid management and resumption of ent enteral feeding, mobilization and care of lines. Coming to the first component, that is the post-operative analgesia. So usually we put a 19 gauge or 18 gauge epidural catheters in the thoracic, lumbar or caudal segments, and they're usually inserted according to the need of the surgery and congruent to the site of surgical incision. This picture describes, I mean, uh, shows you the various uh, components of an epidural set with an epidural needle, a loss of resistance uh, syringe, a catheter, a filter, and a guide, right? So uh, coming to the post-operative, once the epidural is inserted and the post-operative pain management needs to be taken care of, we need to check the epidural band anesthetic band. So in older children, similar to adults, we can give smaller volumes of local anesthetic, two to three ml, okay, and check the band and they will reply to the questions. In infants or extremely small children, an ice test can be tried when the infant is sleeping. So at the site of the surgical uh, incision, which is the block dermatome, we put an ice cube at our institute and gradually move to the site of the unblocked area so no response at the operative site versus movement of the child at the normal site is highly suggestive of a working epidural. However, this is and should be interpreted with caution. Gentle palpation of the surgical site can also be done. And this should not, however, be repeated at every visit. So these are some of the techniques that we often use to check the uh, adequacy of the anesthetic band. Now, what are the what is the protocol if the anesthetic uh, band uh, if there is inadequate pain relief with an ongoing epidural analgesia, we can either give an epidural an additional bolus to block additional three to four dermatomes. Additional boluses, uh, the nature will depend on the rate of the ongoing infusion and permissible volume so that we do not exceed the toxic dose. If the basal infusion does not permit an additional bolus, 0.5 or 1 will be used instead of levobupivacaine. And if we go up on the volume of basal infusion, then we need to reduce the concentration or dilute it further so that we do not exceed the toxic dose. If, however, the epidural catheter has a band which is not congruent to the surgical site and the epidural catheter is threaded more than three to five centimeters in the epidural space, consider withdrawing the catheter only after confirming the coagulation profile and when there is no major blood loss that has been 
uh, that has occurred in the intraoperative period. So, what are the doses of the epidural local anesthetic? For continuous epidural infusion, we use a bupivacaine uh, dose of 0.2 mg per kilo per hour in children who are less than 4 months. Between 4 and 18 months, we use a dose of 0.25 mg per kilo per hour. And more than 18 months, we advocate a dose of 0.3 to 0.375 mg per kilo per hour. If a higher volume rate is required, concentration has to be reduced to ensure that maximum dose of local anesthetic has not been exceeded. The preferred concentration of local anesthetic is 0.05 to 0.1 percent leuvabupivacaine. And epidural test doses and bolus doses of infusions or local anesthetics should are usually avoided in children who are on mechanical ventilation and with hemodynamic instability who are on vasopressors. In these children, we often advocate uh, sedation and opioid uh, infusions so that the pain relief can be taken care of. However, the epidural can be restarted when we are planning weaning from the ventilator. Epidural additives, the most common epidural additives are opioids. So in children who are less than six months of age, we usually avoid opioids and fentanyl is the preferred op opioid at our institute. Between six months to 12 years, we can give one microgram per ml of local anesthetic. And uh, in children who are more than 12 years of age, fentanyl two microgram per ml with the local anesthetic can be added as an epidural additive. We use elastomeric pumps with multi-rate balloon pumps. Okay, the infusion can be adjusted to 2, 3 and 5 ml depending on the weight of the child, the dermatomes to be covered and the dose requirement. So there is a variable rate infuser here and a balloon elastomeric pump and you can change the rate of infusion by using the key and changing the rate. Again, how do you measure pain scores in children? It's extremely challenging. There are various scores described with the two important ones being the flag scale, which is the face, legs, activity, cry and consolability with the maximum score being 10 and the minimum score being zero. Okay, so it is preferable to get the score as low as possible. And self-reported pain scales can be used in older children. Apart from this, the Wong Baker scale, which has this faces scale with 10 showing as maximum uh, hertz maximum and uh, zero showing as no hurt. Usually children comprehend to these facial expressions very well and they can tell you what is the amount of pain that they are currently having. So uh, coming to the next component, if the epidurals are contraindicated or central neuraxial blockade has some uh, problems, uh, then we can often use truncal catheters or regional catheters, which has been very popular in the recent past and are getting increasingly popular with rectus sheet, thoda transversus abdominis plane catheters, quadratus lumborum erectus spinae paravertebral. These are all the other truncal blocks that have been described in literature and are various and are practiced at various institutes. Coming to the parent or nurse controlled analgesia techniques. So in children whom we cannot give regionals or uh, uh, we, we cannot get central neuraxial blockade, we often prefer a CAD legacy TCA pump which could be parent controlled or nurse controlled analgesia and we usually use fentanyl in this, these pumps. After controlling the baseline pain by giving one microgram per kilo to reduce the baseline pain scores, parents should be counseled about the side effect profile of the opioid use and we, use a, we do not use a basal infusion. We use a demand dose with 0.5 microgram per kilo with a lockout interval of 20 minutes with this PCA pump. So this is a parent or a nurse controlled analgesia technique. Apart from this, various coanalgesics like intravenous paracetamol, depending on the weight of the child, the dose can be adjusted and the interval needs to be uh, taken care of with intravenous paracetamol. Also oral route also can be used with uh, if it is not a contraindication. So less than three months and more than three months, depending on the age of the child, 10 milligram per kilo or 15 milligram per kilo every eight hourly or six, or six to eight hourly can be advocated. Apart from this, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, which, have, which has been licensed from three months of age. So between three and six months, five milligram per kilo and more than six months, 10 milligram per kilo every eight hourly is usually advocated. Diclofenac can be given one milligram per kilo uh, more than ch ch in children more than six or uh, months to a year with a maximum dose of three milligram per kilo per day whenever we are using NSAIDs. It is preferable to use this for a short duration of one to three days. Ibuprofen has the least side effect profile. And if you need to use it for a longer time, 
then co-prescription of a PPI is advised. Coming to the second bit, that is the post-operative monitoring, apart from the routine monitoring of uh, cardiovascular system, respiratory system with ECG, NIBP, pulse oximetry, temperature, uh, alertness, pain score, urine output, sugars, temperature of peripheries and capillary defill time, some specific monitoring like invasive blood pressure monitoring, arterial blood gas showing oxygenation, ventilation and acid base status, central venous pressure, arterial lactate, perfusion status, transthoracic echo showing the IVC diameter and perfusion status can also be used. Point of care coagulation testing like thromboelastography can be used in uh, children who have had a major blood loss, intraoperative blood loss. Apart from that, ventilatory parameters, input-output charting, abdominal girth, bowel movement, Ryle's tube aspirate and nasogastric tube aspirate, uh, incidence of post-operative nausea vomiting, movement of the chest tube, uh, drains, surgical drains and wound site can also be inspected and these, this will give you a lot of other additional information. Coming to the third component, that is the post-operative mechanical ventilation. The indications of post-operative mechanical ventilation are <clears throat> a child with hypothermia, massive blood loss with dyselectrolytemia, coagulopathy needing correction, extensive surgical resection with retroperitoneal dissection, bowel handling, and a surge response, hemodynamic instability, inadequate respiratory attempts or a uh, patient being sedated and unable to maintain spontaneous breathing are some of the indications where children need to go on post-operative mechanical ventilation. We try and get children extubated as early as possible and as soon as they are alert, warm, comfortable, pain-free and hemodynamically stable. Coming to the post-operative delirium, so Lewis and colleagues reported an incidence of 18% of emergence agitation and emergence delirium, which is synonymous, in children between 3 to 7 years of age. And it usually lasts between 14 minutes, but may go on up to 45 minutes. It is described as a dissociated state of consciousness after anesthesia and is characterized by crying, thrashing, kicking, uncooperative behavior, inconsolability, incoherence, unresponsiveness, irritability, and psychomotor agitation. So these are some of the characteristics that are used to describe post-operative delirium. This is a very good article, which is a review article published in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2017, giving a brief overview of the pediatric emergence delirium, and it gives a uh, comprehensive uh, review and interpretation of literature. So what are the proposed contributors to emergence delirium? Use of volatile anesthetics, certain types of surgery like ENT surgery and head neck surgery, patient age between three to seven years of age, parental increased parental and patient anxiety, patient pre-existing behavior, and uh, patient and parent interaction with healthcare providers are some of the compo components and contributors to development of emergence delirium. There's a PEED score that has been described, which has five criteria, and each criteria has five points. So maximum achievable score is 20. A score or, uh, of more than or equal to 10 has 64% sensitivity and 86% specificity for the diagnosis of emergence delirium. And a score of more than or equal to 12 has 100% sensitivity and 94.5% uh, 94 specificity for the diagnosis of emergence delirium. The components are this uh, of this score are eye contact, purposeful movement, awareness of surroundings, restlessness, inconsolability, and they are scored based on this score. This is widely available on the internet as a scoring system. So what are the strategies to decrease the incidence of emergence delirium? Behavior management, uh, using TIVA more than volatile anesthetics, gradually reducing the dosage of volatile anesthetics, uh, acupuncture, regional anesthesia with adequate pain control, and certain medications like alpha-2 agonists, melatonin, gabapentin are known to decrease the incidence of emergence delirium. Uh, coming to the post-operative investigations, a CBC and a coagulation profile with TEG for massive blood transfusion with coagulopathy is warranted. Arterial blood gas with electrolytes, that is sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium can be done. RFTs, LFTs, depending on the blood loss and the surgery performed. Sugars need to be monitored. Any other investigations based on the surgery that has been done. Post-operative fluid therapy and enteral feeding. 
So enteral feeding or oral feeding has to resume as soon as the child is fully awake and it is surgically feasible. Maintenance IV fluids in the post-operative period should be of isotonic solutions with appro appropriate uh, volume of potassium chloride and dextrose as they significantly decrease the risk of developing hyponatremia and hypoglycemia. IV fluids should be given only till the child is NBM preferably with 1% DRL to avoid protein catabolism and avoid hypoglycemia. So what is the importance of 1% or 2% DRL? Because of the dextrose, it avoids hypoglycemia and the problems of starvation ketosis. And avoiding excessive amount of dextrose avoids hyperglycemia and osmotic diuresis with dyselectrolytemia. So isotonic solution is preferred because the hypotrenatremia incidence is lower. An increased ADH in the perioperative period uh, causes an increased incidence of fluid retention in children. So that is why isotonic fluid will help avoid this development of dyselectrolytemia and hyponatremia. The other general measures in pediatrics are parental presence is very calming to the child. Usually uh, toys, videos and distraction techniques are also advocated. IV access should be splint, uh, splinted so that they don't come out and you don't have a thrashing child with no IV access. Faster mobilization with adequate pain relief, warm environment, adequate forced air warming, maintenance of ambient temperature, early removal of lines, tubes, rise tubes, Foley's catheters and drains are uh, essential. Dressing of lines like PICC and central line are necessary for long term use to avoid infection. So this, uh, there are a lot of articles on the internet uh, which uh, show this enhanced recovery program in pediatrics. It is an upcoming trend. And in the post-operative, it has three components, pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative. The post-operative components which we've covered, like minimization of drains, duration, minim uh, early mobilization, occupational therapy, early use, early oral and, and enteral nutrition, diet progression, and scheduled multimodal analgesics are over some of the components that we have already discussed in our talk. So coming to the procedure-specific post-operative management, there are three different surgeries that I will be covering which are essential in the post-operative management. So neuroblastoma is one of them, which has been covered by Dr. Bohr in the earlier lectures. So major blood loss may lead to hypotension, coagulopathy, acute renal failure, ischemic bowel, and needs to be addressed in an intensive care setting, management of intravascular fluid status, vasopressors, and hemodynamics is important for the first 24 to 48, 48 hours, as some of them are known to have a turbulent perioperative course. Again, coming to Wilms tumor, major blood loss, hemodynamic instability, coagulopathy for large tumors and major resections is important. Urine output needs to be monitored and renal failure needs to be looked for, especially in case of bilateral tumors. There is There may be a requirement for dialysis and patients may become dialysis dependent. Hyperkalemia should also be watched for. Tumor thrombos, thrombus with embolization into the pulmonary circulation and pulmonary embolism needs to be watched for. Hypertension, renin levels may fall post-resection in renin secreting tumors but blood pressure may take a month to normalize. So antihypertensives can be discontinued approximately after one to three weeks post-surgery because the patient's blood pressure may remain high for a couple of days post-surgery. Coming to the last bit, that liver resections, post-operatively uh, in major liver resections with blood loss, coagulation parameters, TEG, hemodynamics, urine output needs to be monitored. Sugars and liver profiles need to be ruled uh, to to be monitored need to be monitored to rule out liver failure. Again, monitor for postoperative liver dysfunction, bleeding, coagulation uh, abnormalities, renal dysfunction, and give adequate coverage with antibiotics uh, due to increased incidence of sepsis and infections. Thank you for patient uh, listening. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your informative lecture. Okay, Dr. Sapil. Hi. Uh, now, uh, thank you for our speakers and moderators. It has been a very informative uh, webinar, and we have many questions. Uh, so, uh, we can start with, um, I think there was a question regarding uh, the... Um, 
guidelines to initiate a fluid therapy uh, after the removal of the tumor, tumor during surgery. I think Dr. Janan uh, may answer this. Uh, how do you manage and the, the fluid therapy after the tumor has been resected or taken out, the vasodilation? Uh, Hi, um, thank you for giving me this question. Uh, first of all, we give crystalloid solutions, but if you give too much crystalloid solutions, like a 30, 50 ml per kilogram, then you may use a collate also. Um, you may use 5% albumin or hydroxyacetyl starch, and you can give both doses, but uh, avoid to um, give too much because we know after that we might have pulmonary edema. That's why always take a control. Uh, if you use uh, remifentanil or esmolol before uh, whatever you use, just stop that. And also you should follow the surgeon, how he managed the tumor. And uh, before he uh, uh, clamp the tumor, put the clamp the tumor from, from the gate before ligation, you should be ready uh, to close, uh, to turn it off all the um, remifentanil or whatever you use, esmolol or others. And give the flute and always be prepared uh, for the hypotension and keep ready uh, all the nor norepinephrine, sometimes epinephrine. But in my experience, we, we got too many neuroblastoma till that time. Uh, I can say last two, two years also, we have nearly 50. And uh, since 2000, we have 280 neuroblastoma patients. I can say just two or three of them had hypertension, not more than much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Janan. And again, uh, I'm continuing with you that uh, there is another question regarding the uh, sodium nitroprusit usage in pediatric patients. Uh, yeah. Do we use it or uh, we not. Any, any precautions that we yeah. uh, when use it? Uh, the, your comments, please. Yeah, uh, sodium nitroprusit is, is really very, very potent agent. And you have to be very careful. Also, uh, if you go up to a high level, high dose of uh, level, then you can see toxicity too. And uh, you can use, uh, you can see um, carboxyhemoglobin rise up and uh, you go, hypotension, uh, hypotension goes very deeply. So it's, um, uh, therapy uh, is very sensitive. Um, I don't prefer to use for children, uh, but in the literature you can see uh, that if you don't have any other agent, uh, maybe you can use very precautiously. Thank you. And then uh, we had another question regarding the dose of tranexamic acid uh, during the operation. When do you begin? Which dose? And how long do yeah. you continue to use it? Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, uh, while surgeon uh, goes to incision. That time we start, if we, you know, always we check the tumor before, how big it is, how uh, close relationship to others, all veins and arteria. That's why we, um, we, uh, we see uh, if the tumor is going to bleed. That's why we give in the beginning of the operation, 15 per kilograms. But if the patients keep bleeding, then we might see we might uh, use infusion also. Infusion doses is five to 10 uh, milligram per kilogram uh, hour. So you can use infusion, but we don't need that much. Sometimes we, um, if it's, we, we see it's bleeding, we give another boluses also, but uh, then we don't need others. Uh, does any other of our speakers have any comments on these questions? You can also uh, make contributions. Uh, and the one more uh, question is about TIVA in uh, neuroplastoma during surgery. Uh, are there strong evidences that uh, saying that use TIVA or use inhalation? What's no, in, in children, we don't have any uh, studies on that. It's, it's uh, really uh, tough to do uh, studies in children also. 
But we know many studies on the uh, animal studies and some of the adult studies, even retrospective studies, we can say don't uh, use volatile agents. But some of the uh, data we know, uh, it might have negative effect on it. So if we have a choice, why don't we use TIVA? We can use propofol very, and we know the uh, propofol has many um, good effect also the, uh, on the postoperative vomiting and nausea and delirium, etc. So we can use it. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jaman. Uh, May I make a comment? Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> Just about this surgery, I think what is so important as monitoring is not so much our machines, but it's communication. And it is the communication between us and the surgeon or between the surgeon and us that he anticipates, that he tells us what is happening, what he's doing. We look at, at the field, at the operation field and see how he's doing, if he's having, having difficulties with with, uh, with some um, uh, venous or artery. Um, and, and, and the communication is the best monitoring of, uh, of a safe surgery, I would say. You are right. Uh, and also uh, for uh, Dr. Jason, uh, do you uh, use uh, gabapentin or pregabalin? Uh, or when do you begin if you uh, uh, expect too much pain after postoperative uh, pain in those children in order to prevent chronic pain or your experience about this? Correct. So uh, the issue is uh, if you're managing the acute pain in the perioperative period, usually the incidence of that progressing to chronic pain is a relatively rare thing in children, but it's not uh, unknown. So it, you can take it immediately postoperatively. We do not advocate uh, starting gabapentin or uh, pregabalin at our institute unless it's a thoracotomy or a high risk for uh, uh, neuropathic pain in the postoperative period. So in the initial three or four days, we have a dedicated acute pain service and uh, uh, who goes on uh, regularly monitoring these patients for at least a couple of days in the postoperative period. And then we have a chronic pain uh, OPD. So if the pain persists or if it continues beyond uh, four or five days and cannot be explained uh, by the perioperative period, you find out what is the nature and the cause for the pain. And if it satisfies the pain detect criteria for any of the neuropathic or progression to chronic pain, then definitely we refer to the chronic pain OPD and or uh, if the patient is admitted in the ward, we do uh, start them on gabapentin, maybe 10 milligram per kilo uh, or depending on the age and weight of the child. And if that is a risk for developing chronic pain, definitely it's uh, justified in starting. So pregabalin, uh, we don't advocate because it's a ready capsule. We don't have formulations which can change the concentration but fortunately for gabapentin we have a syrup uh, which is available so you can titrate the dose depending on the weight of the child so gabapentin is uh, definitely preferred versus uh, pregabalin only in indicated cases thank you thank you dr jason uh, doc, uh, Dr. Hisu, uh, Kim, can, uh, will you want? Uh, do you want to ask the uh, questions to our speakers? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Bo, okay. Uh, there is a problem for the transfusion, right? Okay. Do you have any uh, idea for the transfusion guideline for uh, for the uh, for those children? And for the neuroblastoma, there is no specific guidelines for neuroblastoma. But for the uh, tumor child, uh, restrictive uh, approach should be used. And uh, for the guideline says, till 7 and 8 grams uh, per deciliter is enough. But if the patient is uh, in newborn, newborn and if it's uh, in on the mechanical ventilation, you may rise up to 12. But uh, you should um, manage the uh, oxygenation and hemodynamically stabilization. Uh, for the infant, seven gram is enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, answer. I, I have a, one question to Lucas, Dr. Lucas. Okay. 
Um, do you have any idea for using PICC for those children? Perfectly inserted the central caseta, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, well, there, there was also the question of uh, an attendant asking if the total intravenous anesthesia was the right yes. um, standard. And uh, before answering actually this question, because I would say, yes, of course, it is a very good way of uh, handling these patients. But still, the question you have to ask yourself is, what are your means? And this is one of the key questions. Do we have in uh, central access? Or if we don't, what kind of other alternatives would we have? And it's interesting because uh, there have been different surveys uh, on which we, I participated to understand what the usual, uh, well, standards would be, the usual protocols would be in radiation centers. And uh, actually 60 to 70% would answer that TIVA would be the, 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 what they use. Uh, the inhalation um, anesthesia would be an alternative to it because in this case, we would be less dependent on, uh, on um, central catheters. And so it's interesting to understand the right balance between how invasive we should be also according to what kind of means we have. Uh, I, I think a second question on this behalf is uh, more, more even more important than uh, uh, venous access would be uh, what kind of airway management would we do in iterative an anesthesia? And uh, I don't want to anticipate in a certain way because I said I would not give you recipes, but I think laryngeal mask is really something extremely useful. And I've been very, I've been, during these six years, I've been performing this, um, this anesthesia in proton ther therapy center. I was very happy that somebody invented 25 years ago this device because it's very useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. May I have uh, one question to uh, Dr. Lucas? Could you uh, share uh, your experience about TIVA in uh, uh, PA3, especially in radio, uh, radiation therapy? Yes. Um, yes. Um, well, it, to tell you the truth, we do uh, any kind of uh, of, uh, of um, protocol. We have both inhalation as also TIVA. Uh, with TIVA, what we would do is rather doing the induction in a special room. Um, we use usually well propofol, or it might be also some. Sometimes we use the sedation with the dexmedetomidine in intravenously. Um, but the, let's say the, the, the depth of anesthesia will be more, uh, let's say, less, um, less clearly uh, shown unless we do a, a, a very, uh, well, deep anesthesia right from the beginning. And in this case, we have to adapt uh, to, the, uh, to the patient and every patient is different. We see many dif big differences uh, in, it, in the posology, in the, in the need of qu uh, what kind of uh, quantity we want to, in to inject according to the patients. So we don't have standard. But what I usually do is give a heavy dosage, which, well, which would be uh, uh, much more than the, the classical four milligrams kilo. Uh, as, as the induction and, and then uh, adapt myself according to the, the response of the child. Um, I, we, most of the time we would use inhalation therapy uh, treatment, uh, anesthesia, because uh, it gives us much more, we can foresee much better what is going to happen. Because with TIVA, if, the ch if we don't uh, have the right um, dosage, uh, the child might be or too uh, superficial and then he, the child would be moving. And again, you lose, well, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, according, or the, the child might be coughing. And then if, the, if during the treatment, during the radiation, the child is coughing, it's not, not such a nice thing. Or it, it, is, it would be too deep. And if you don't have laryngeal mask, you will, the child will go in an apnea and will not breathe. And then it's again catastrophe and you have to rush into the, in the, into the treatment room. So inhalation is, I think, a very good alternative because it really tells you the depth of the child. Also, uh, inhalation gives you the, the, the opportunity to have a very, very fast recovery. But 
sometimes, and that week I can tell you, we saw children who had with inhalation um, so fast recoveries. Therefore, it's very important to have a very quiet environment because if it's too fast, this delirium we were talking about before, you were talking about before, is something that we could experience not very often, but let's say in a 5% of our cases. And this is very very unpleasant and therefore sometimes you need uh, some uh, um, some more drugs like for instance what we do when the child is uh, asleep we div give intranasal uh, midazolam just to to allow the child to wake up slowly and calmly calmer and, and to have a, a, a physiological uh, a sleep before get, getting up so there are many different kind of techniques and i think it's really very interesting to discuss them yeah, thank you. Um, yes, one more question to uh, Dr. Jason. Um, could you uh, explain a bit about uh, multimodal analgesic strategy and how can we educate to the nurse uh, to provide that? Yes. Correct. So uh, when we have uh, patients who are post-operative uh, immediate in the for major resection surgeries like a hepatoblastoma or a neuroblastoma or a Wilms tumor with an epidural infusion in place, till we document a working epidural anesthetic band, we usually prefer to keep these children in the recovery room. Once we have a documented anesthetic band, once we take care of the baseline pain, we start them on an elastomeric pump, which I described in my talk. And depending on the concentration and the volume that we infuse through the epidural catheter, we consider shifting them on the floor to the ward. Uh, we have a dedicated acute pain service team which visits these uh, patients, pediatric as well as adult. We have a database uh, for every day, whoever has uh, is due for an epidural removal or whoever is not comfortable on a working epidural, whoever needs an uh, additional dose. So we have a pain list and we visit these patients on the floor and uh, we... Uh, Try and augment uh, the analgesic effect by uh, giving them uh, either a parent-controlled or a nurse-controlled analgesia or co-analgesics either by the intravenous route with fentanyl or uh, opioids or uh, paracetamol. And uh, if they are on orals, we definitely consider ibuprofen, ibuprofen and paracetamol syrup combinations. So this is how with multimodal uh, strategy, we try and optimize the pain relief of these children. And uh, there is a pain sister in the ward who, along with the hemodynamics charting, they usually chart the pain as the fifth vital sign. So there's a dedicated uh, nursing team in the pediatric ward who takes care of the, and uh, who is aware of how to uh, assess pain in these children. So whenever they feel that the pain relief is not adequate, they usually call on the dedicated mobile number that we have for the pain service. And the pain team goes and visits them and sorts out all these pain issues. If we are not comfortable with this child in the ward or he requires, he or she requires a lot of uh, opioids or analgesics, we usually tend and avoid these things on the floor. We try and shift them back to the recovery room, optimize the pain relief and make sure that they go back because we don't want to give opioids or any additional boluses in an unsupervised environment. So that's a word of caution there that. Uh, no baseline infusions of opioids and uh, nothing uh, which is unsafe in the ward for sure. If you want to give any of this, you are free to do so, but after shifting the patient to the recovery room. Okay? So that's an important message there. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, I have a, a question for the PNV problem. But do you have any uh, suggest for the prevention of POMV for the children, Dr. Dr. Kenneboro? Uh, so yeah. Uh, um, POMV problem, luckily we don't see much because neuroblastoma patients are uh, infants, uh, mainly, you know, under four years old. Um, PC. And under three years old, we don't see too much uh, PME, PNOV. But if the patient uh, gives the history about former uh, operation, she had too much vomiting and nausea. And if the patient, the parent says uh, she has motion sickness, then you may do, uh, you may give um, medication. 
at the end of the operation. You can give on Dancetron 0.15 milligram per kilogram. And uh, so you can um, you can keep the patient without vomiting and nausea. Then the dexmethotomidine, they don't uh, suggest to use because of dexmethotomidine might uh, suppress the immune suppression, even though even single dose uh, suppression didn't show, but uh, just, uh, you know, might have. And uh, also some uh, studies about the dexamethasone has uh, tumor, tumor lesis, lesis uh, can make a tumor lesis. That's why they don't suggest using dexamethasone, uh, sorry, uh, dexamethasone. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, suggestion. So you mean that, uh, you mean the dexamethasone rather than uh, dexamethotamide, right? Yes, yes, dexamethasone. Oh, okay. Dexamethotamide, okay. I like dexamethasone. Uh, okay, the dexamethotamidine, sorry. Dexamethotamidine, okay. especially for the delirium, it's it's really nice drug. Okay. Uh, at the end of the surgery, we give dexamethotamidine uh, just uh, 0.5 uh, microgram per kilogram and uh, is a uh, five uh, minutes bolus. And after that, uh, waking up child, and it, it, it you you know if you use you will see the uh, difference, and uh, we don't see too much delirium if we use the dexmethotomidine. Uh, also for the premedication it's good, but if the uh, operation time is too short because of the uh, dexmethotomidine effect is long, I suggest you shouldn't use just the uh, small procedures, but the uh, uh, big procedures, uh, big operations, you can use for premedication also, intranasally, and also uh, it's um, it's easy to tolerate for children. And as you know, uh, midazolam taste is really bitter. I don't know, did you taste it? It's it's uh, uh, sometimes uh, I'm very sorry for the child, even though we put in a. a so uh, in, in juice, uh, it's uh, not uh, easy to swallow it. But dexmethotomidine, it's uh, intranasally, didn't hurt them. Just, you know, and also they get used to uh, get nasal drops and air uh, sometimes. Uh, so they don't uh, refuse it uh, like oral, oral midazolam. We, we use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, nice answers. And uh, I want to ask uh, dexmethodomidine uh, about a question uh, with dexmethodomidine. Dr. Lucas, do you use it during uh, radiotherapy uh, premedications uh, for uh, for a child coming every day as a premedication? Uh, I think uh, it can be used, but I couldn't find any studies about that. Uh, yes, there are no studies about this, but um, we used it actually sometimes in very specific patients that had very difficult uh, waking ups. So uh, we use it once the induction was done. So there was no aggressive behavior from our side and we would just give it intranasally uh, up to one mi microgram uh, per kilo. And uh, so their waking up would be very, very uh, smooth. And, uh, and this delirium we were talking about would not happen. The thing is that it takes a long time. And that means that the child will stay in our recovery room for, well, quite a long time, up to one hour or more, which on a daily basis is okay. But it depends on the parents also. Some children and some parents, just once they did their anesthesia, they just want to go and go away. Others will stay and they will play with their, with their friends because there are other uh, children around and we have a playground. And so, so it depends very much on the patient. Uh, the post-anesthesia uh, period, I think, is getting much nicer if you give these children to drink or to eat right away and it becomes a kind of routine a ritual and so many of our children uh, 
they wake up and they get the milk right away and they start sucking on the milk and that make is the best is the best uh, way of, of of calming them down if ever they were uh, kind of um, let's say nervous which is actually very interesting because uh, after having done a lot of surgery in difficult countries uh, in Africa and uh, we did we didn't have many means and the best analgesic even for big surgery is always the mother's breast and this is fascinating huh? I have a comment on that. Uh, so, uh, like Dr. Lucas described, that uh, if you were giving dexmedetomidine for a daycare uh, procedure where uh, they are absolutely going to be uh, coming in every day, you and dexmedetomidine is not a drug which is without uh, problems. You can have dangerous bradycardia. You can have dangerous uh, hypotension. So. If you have better drugs available or if you can resume, resume oral feeds as early as possible, I think that's a safer bet. And if you need to give these drugs, then they are best given in patients who are going to be monitored for a good amount of time in the post-operative recovery. That is a good take-home message that you can't be sending them off by giving it intranasal or orally and maybe going back home within half an hour. I, I don't think that's the uh, thing that we should uh, accept. Yes, I very much agree with this. Uh, and that's why I was uh, speaking about uh, the means and the infrastructures. In a radiation center, very often you don't have a recovery room, but this is something which we should have. And uh, I'm glad that we have a very good recovery room and we can wait and the, peop the, the, the patients are monitored until they are really uh, uh, well awake. And this is something very important because I realized this is a political will. When uh, um, uh, uh, the administration builds up a radiation center, center, they very often forget about anesthesia. <laughs> and this is something that we as clinicians have to, to, uh, to emphasize about uh, on, on, the, on the administration. But uh, anyway, dexmedetomidine uh, is something we use very rarely. Uh, also, because the length of uh, of of its action is is for our, our uh, well our standards too long, and we want children to be able to to be to to go away as soon as possible after the anesthesia. Okay. Um, yes, to Dr. Lucas opted. Um, I have a like. Do you have a scavenging system in radiation therapy unit or? As I seen in the uh, presentation, you show the child with uh, uh, like a VO and you have a mask. This is uh, inhalation plus nitro oxide and oxygen. Uh, we don't use uh, N two two O anymore. We 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 don't use uh, any. We just use uh, anesthetic halogens like Sevoran, but no no other uh, uh, complementary uh, gas. Uh, but we have an, a scavenging system, which actually, again, we, we come back to the infrastructures. Uh, when I was asked to build up the center, there was nothing. And I, I really, and I was lucky because administration for a short time was very compliant and they gave me many of the, of the devices and the infrastructures I asked for. And I, when we, so we could have a, a scavenging system. Uh, I, I agree. If you don't have a scavenging system, uh, or this, the, you know, this alt absorber, uh, which absorbs also the halogens, then you should not use inhalation in a radiation center. That would be really not, then you should use only uh, intravenous. Uh, but uh, yes, if you have it, uh, I think uh, inhalation uh, is a very good alternative to intravenous um, anesthesia. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers and our moderators. I think there are lots of uh, issues to discuss since this is a very, very empty uh, topic. Uh, I think we will be discussing these issues uh, later on uh, during um, maybe in the conferences in uh, France or in Istanbul. Uh, now we have to uh, end up our uh, webinar. Uh, it's clear that we need a, a team approach for education, nurses, and for the care of our cancer patients. So uh, 
At the end of the webinar, I want to remind that the certificate of attendances will be automatically generated and forwarded to those who submitted the post-webinar surveys. These post-webinar surveys will be forwarded tomorrow at 5 uh, Singapore time through emails. So please ensure that you have correctly keyed in your full names and emails so that you can get the right certificate of attendance. Uh, and uh, please do not forget to follow us uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, and like us and visit us at our website at aspa 20 thousand.com uh, um, you can be a member of aspa through that website as well uh, it has many advantages and it's a lifelong membership uh, and um, we have uh, we are continuing to our webinars and our uh, next webinar uh, will be on 19th of june and will be on the pediatric airway uh, we have very precious speakers there, uh, Professor Henry Tan, Dr. Nandini Dave, and Dr. Josephine Tan, also who is head of the uh, press, our president of the ASPA. Uh, so uh, stay tuned and uh, please uh, rem remember that you have to, uh, in order to join the webinars, uh, you have to uh, register first. Uh, registration is free so that you can get the uh, next announcements. Uh, and uh, I want to remind you that we have our uh, annual meeting of ASPA 2022 at Istanbul. It's uh, between 14th and 16th October. Uh, please visit the website and uh, you can register to our uh, meeting as well as to the uh, workshops. Uh, they are uh, quickly going on and, uh, and uh, we have very few places left. Uh, and uh, please organize your uh, journey to Istanbul. Uh, welcome to Istanbul uh, on October. Uh, and we have uh, some more announcements regarding uh, ASPA. Uh, we have our virtual um, ASPA annual general meeting on 24th of July. Uh, so uh, the registration link was sent to all ASPA members through their emails. Please check your emails and your spam boxes as well. Um, we, uh, we will be very glad to have you in that annual general meeting. Uh, and also, uh, I want to remind that uh, ASPA is an um, empowering uh, through education uh, society. Our mission is to foster the highest standard of pediatric anesthesia care in Asia. And we, uh, the ASPA is a non-profit organization. So we seek your help to donate and help us in our cause. Please stay tuned with us and uh, up to meeting uh, the third Sunday of June. Hope to see you there. Thank you for joining. Recording stopped.